Good morning, doctor. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Absolutely fantastic. I've got to give you a, a real life situation. Yesterday, I was with Yancey Ford and Dr. Hetty uh, Cunningham, and and in listening to them, I thought, wow, I've got a conversation with with my doctor when I go in this morning. What as a real <laughs> as a real person, where are we going to go wrong? Because this message that you're sharing in the color of care is unbelievable. But we need to make sure that we're all on the same page. Yeah, well, that's quite an opening gambit. Wait, tell, tell me a little bit more. Well, uh, it, it, what, what do you mean exactly? Well, in, in the way that I, I, I told him, I said, you're, you're not going to believe this, Doc. I mean, it, it's like the color of care, which is on Smithsonian. I, I really think this is going to be a game changer. It's going to open the door for us to start making corrections and, and, re, and changing people's lives. And he kind of looked at me going, like, like I was crazy, and I'm going, oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, well, he hasn't seen it yet, but I, I think um, part of the power of not just the documentary but this conversation and the whole campaign that we're doing is that uh, it, 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 it is by far the most honest conversation I've ever had. Uh, I was sitting across from Yance like fall 2020 and um, have never talked about racism in the healthcare system in such stark terms. But part of the power is it's really arriving at a moment where, like, it's undeniable, right? Like, I mean, it's um, COVID really took, like, all these inequities in our society, threw it into a pressure cooker and, like, like threw it into your face. Like, you, you can't deny its existence. So. And isn't it odd that something so evil became a beacon of light in, in hope for others? I hope so. Um, yeah, I mean, I think... Uh, I wish the pandemic never happened for right, sure. Right. Um, but I, I, I think that, you know, I'm definitely hopeful about the ways that it's encouraged change. And, uh, you know, uh, Oprah herself was motivated by a story of uh, the Fowler family and, you know, a person who went to three different hospitals and was turned away and ultimately died. Mm. Um, so, um, anyway, I, 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 I am very hopeful that uh, by, by having a number of physicians, including myself, people in the healthcare system that have occupied prominent roles, just be very honest. Real stories and the experiences of those that, that, that have lived it. I mean, I, I love how, how honest the, the approach is on this and that it's not doctored up. It's not doctored up, no. I actually, it's the first time I've really thought about that as a turn of phrase um, as a doctor myself. Mm-hmm. But no, it is uh, putting the in, the entire problem of racism in the healthcare system in stark relief, and then asking, you know, uh, Yance is off the camera, but he asked really incisive and probing questions about why, 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 and we take it all the way back to this really sordid history in the United States where. Um, you know, the institution of slavery and the institution of American medicine grow up at the same time. And the job of the Southern doctor during slavery was to help commodify people. And to put- One of the things that um, during, during the COVID lockdown, I needed to be with people badly. And so my wife said, yeah. there's, there's only one place where you're going to go to be with people. You got to go to the front line and you're going to, and you're going to have to toughen it up, mister. And I went to the front line, which was a grocery store. Doctor, I see more nationalities that need medical help. And, and, and I think maybe that's why this has touched me even more is because I am with these people every single day. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that was, um, that resonates arrow. I mean, the, pandemic basically divides the world into people who can protect themselves and people who can't. Mm -hmm. And this is true across, you know, geopolitical borders. It's true across neighborhood blocks, but it's even true in some of our common spaces, like the grocery store where, you know, everyone's got to eat and you got to go get groceries. And some people are positioned to like go get their groceries and then go home. And other people uh, to make a living, to earn a living wage, they've got to drive a bus or they've got to do other things where they're being repeatedly exposed. And, um, you saw that like when the people that came into my hospital who were really sick came in, you could see the racial differences yep. with your eyeballs. How did that change you as a human being? Because I mean, I, I, I would love to see your daily writing, your journals and things, because I, I, you, there's no way none of this just sat there inside of you. Oh, no way. I mean, I, I've got some stark journals. I'll be honest with you, but I think that, um, Honestly, like, so I was a, uh, I am a professor and uh, had done a lot of writing myself about um, the healthcare system, how it can be improved, um, the challenges that we have around whether or not you're going to thrive. 
And that just strikes me as so immoral. Um, so I, uh, I took a leave from the university and I went full time into trying to fix that problem. You're that solutions person, aren't you? I mean, I, 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 I love that about the way that you will go, okay, so we have, a, we have a problem, but there needs to be a solution, and let's go. I think so. I mean, I think something I was taught as a professor is that 95% of solving a problem is defining it correctly. So I spent a long time trying to understand why it is that a person in the United States today is 50% more likely to die in childbirth than mm-hmm. her own mother. And it took me about a decade, but ultimately the only way to understand that is through the lens of racism. Because if you're black in America, you're three to four times more likely to die, irrespective of education or income. Um, so, so yeah, and, and you bring it 95% of the way, but then you got to go the last mile and try and fix it. That subject alone has affected the Carolinas in, in all my years that I've been down here. And, and they have tried to make laws. They have tried to reach out. They've tried to create programs and everything like that. And, and, and it, you know, sometimes you'll read in, in the paper that, oh, it's working. Other times you're going, oh, oh we're going backwards. Well, I think when it comes to the well-being of moms, we're definitely going backwards. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, I'm an obstetrician, so that's my concern. But the well-being of mothers is a bellwether for the well-being of society as a whole. So if moms are unwell, society is unwell. And that's why every injustice in our society shows up in maternal mortality, whether it's gender inequity or racial inequity or even generational inequity. The idea that, like, every generation should be leaving things better. There's also a need for systemic and institutional change, like, within our hospitals. And that's one of the things that I'm hoping that our film will uh, encourage is, um, you know, shedding light on, like, literally just like, you know, I was talking to somebody in an earlier interview about um, a hospital in Philadelphia where there's, you know, a person of color on a stretcher and a white person on a stretcher. And even at that level of proximity, the expectation is that uh, even though people should be treated the same, they may not be. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that that are worth unpacking. So let's 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 put focus on that systemic change in, in, in the place of medicine. Is that what I faced this morning with my doctor when he gave me really no reaction at all? I mean, I don't know. I think I think it's worth having empathy for that doc on the front line. Okay. I think uh, anyone in the healthcare system right now, they were massively burned out before the pandemic. Then the pandemic hit, and at risk to themselves, they kept doing their job yeah. by and large. Um, but right now, we're at a point where one in five is ready to leave. That's a huge number, and it's almost a crisis. And it's because, um, you know, burnout is not hard work; it's moral injury. It's the sense that what you're there to do is not aligned with what you're actually doing. Um, and that's that's the fix, right? Like. We, we have to remember that a bad system will beat a good person every time. And fundamentally, our healthcare workers are good people. They're deeply, deeply good people, but they're embedded in these systems that are just not set up. So, you know, just to make this really concrete, one of the ways in which uh, systemic racism works in medicine is that we have these quantitative algorithms where um, we, we determine uh, how is somebody's kidneys working? How likely it is they're going to have a normal delivery? And when we do these predictions, one of the inputs is race. And what happens effectively is you, you put in race, and then it, it, it ends up gatekeeping care uh, because, you know, there's a calculator for your odds of having a normal delivery that has, had been used routinely until this year. You put in black race, and it drops your odds 20% wow. just for being black. Wow. So how do you take the shock and awe of this and turn it into positive fuel, doctor? That I don't know. Hopefully there are smarter people for, than me that are, that are, that are, that are uh, going to figure this out. But I know that a really good start is by you have to be able to name the problem. And I think this is one of the first times in my career where people are being very direct and saying, you know, the problem isn't racial disparity. The problem is racism. Mm. And that racism is not just a matter of individual virtue it's actually something that is embedded in the way that we provide care in our institutions so segregated that you know if you um live in queens like where my family is from your odds of being proximate to uh high quality services are much lower than if you live on the upper east side you know you just you just painted a picture inside my soul when you when you're talking about the different uh, zip codes and things like that and and of course right away my mind goes to the events in Ukraine i think racism will be huge over there as well uh is is there a side of you that says look we as a globe need to be working on this and the color of care is going to wrap around this planet 
One hundred percent. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I have uh, my my grandparents grew up in a colony, so I I I, I think that's part of why uh, this is a subject of, of of great interest to me. But you know, I think during every humanitarian disaster, whether it's a war like what's happening in the Ukraine, or um, a weather event like Hurricane Katrina, wow. or a pandemic like we're talking about now, people of color always suffer disproportionately, and we've got to ask ourselves why. You know, what's really interesting is that this is this is part of the story that when we said we want to get back to a new normal, that our new normal was going to be visibility. It was going to be transparency. And, and that's what I love about the color of care. I do as well. It's a very, very honest documentary. It's wrenching. But I think that it it's also very powerful. It's very watchable, even mm-hmm. though it's a tough subject. And I think it's because it inspires hope. It really does inspire a call to action around uh fundamentally changing the system. And we know, you know, with, with every social movement, with every social inflection point where we make progress, it takes all of us. It takes, it takes collective action. And that's what I'm hoping that the film is going to inspire. I was going to ask you about that. If it was going to be uh, level enough to where I always call it street speak, that, that anybody on the streets would understand what exactly is taking place so that we can start making that movement. I think so. I mean, um, you know, you, you look at, uh, the list of folks who are in it and the number of real people that the filmmakers found um, and, and, and talked to directly about what they experienced from the position of their lived and embodied experience way out, you know, there, there's way more of them than the talking heads like me. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, any human being who watches the film and sees another human being who had to suffer in the ways that these folks did, uh, we'll be able to relate to this. Well, I'm I'm so grateful that you that you're a part of this, and I know that your outreach is going to be just just further and further as we continue to grow as, as this generation forward. Thank you, Arrow. I really appreciate that. Please come back to the show anytime in the future, Doctor. The door is always going to be open for you. You bet. Sounds good. You bet, man. You be brilliant today, sir. Okay. Thank you.